Um, this is officially marks the end of the holiday period for me. I've been taking quite a lot of time in, from the end of July to August to, to recover a bit, actually, from all the activism and from the great successes um, that Extinction Rebellion has had in the last few months in raising the topic of climate change. Um, so yesterday I ended up um, doing, uh, writing an article which will be published in, a, in a, 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 hopefully a couple of different places. And unusually for me, I've decided that today I might try and stick to a script um, and read this to you a little bit. Uh, rather than just going off on my own tangent and rambling and tell you a little bit about my story and also tell you where I am in terms of some of the issues that I'm sort of grappling with and hope they resonate with you and, you know, that they're um, things that we can talk about together because I know that there'll be a question and answer session and I hope some of you will also stick around afterwards to have a chat. So the title of my piece is uh, The End of Civilization or The End of Capitalism using the ecological crisis to reconnect with nature. Um, and I've chosen that because there's a lot of discussion um, and a lot of anxiety about whether we're close to sort of societal collapse, you know, global societal collapse or ecological collapse triggering um, the end of civilization as we know it. And I'm very much of the view that we are, you know, reaching and may already have reached major, major tipping points, there's a huge amount of environmental destruction going on. I know you had a session on that last month. Um, so I'm not going to talk so much about that, but much more on where we are now and what, in particular, Extinction Rebellion and other movements are saying in response to the situation we find ourselves in. So, here goes. Um, on the 16th of April 2019, I superglued my hands to the, Shell, to the headquarters of Shell in London. I tried to get to the main door of their building but fell short as I was surrounded by dozens of neon jacketed policemen. I had been teaching and advising law for about 30 years, but that Tuesday I decided it was time to join those who were going to break the law. How else were we going to get people to pay attention to the climate crisis upon us? I was at Shell because I wanted people to know the company had prior knowledge of climate change as a problem and had covered up the devastating impacts of climate pollution and were continuing to fund oil exploration. But I also wanted to show how ridiculous it was that a law-abiding mother of four should walk away in handcuffs, which is what happened to me, while one of the world's major corporations remains unaccountable for, the, for their role in causing irreversible planetary destruction. My action was part of a much broader wave of peaceful protests by a new movement called Extinction Rebellion, which uses non-violent civil disobedience to highlight the global climate emergency. In my three decades, as I said, as an environmental lawyer, I've been working to create new treaties, you know, work with the EU uh, Commission on new laws at the EU level, and national laws aiming at preventing exactly the kind of environmental damage we now face. But I joined Extinction Rebellion because I've come to realise that this emergency cannot be averted by government signing weak pacts, voluntary agreements with the biggest polluters, nor by tiny adjustments to business as usual, by, for example, creating tar uh, tradable permits or um, uh, bringing in sort of very low green taxes. All these sort of tools allow polluters to merely buy their way out of the problems that they are creating. I've come to see that the present form of capitalism, based on never-ending extraction of natural resources, and an ongoing appropriation of resources belonging to other communities around the world cannot secure social and ecological justice. I think it's time we stopped fixating on trying to modify capitalism. It is destroying the planet and creating injustices that cannot be fixed by policy, policy tweaks here and there. We must use the ecological crisis that is unfolding to create a better civilization. This means we have to stop worrying about whether it's too late, a question I'm asked all the time. Um, for whom? Whom is it too late? For what is it too late? I, I never know when people ask me that question what they're really asking. And it's time to stop asking that question and start overhauling our political system and engage with the present. And I think many people find engaging with the present really difficult. It's much easier to talk about the future, much easier to talk about the past. Very difficult and uncomfortable to be in the present. 
I think this overhaul needs to start by getting money and corruption out of our political systems as a way to limit access to government by big business and by financial oligarchs. We can then create nature-centric, regenerative economic systems that serve the many and not the few. I know I sound a bit like Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> we need to orientate public investment away from subsidising fossil fuel exploration, which we still do in this country. We're one of the, I think, the second largest uh, subsidisers of fossil fuels in the EU. Uh, these benefit largely oil, gas uh, and coal companies. And shifting our entire financial incentives to creating a nature-respecting economy that supports green jobs, improves health by reducing toxic air and water pollution, and prioritise human rights and well-being rather than GDP growth. Above all, we need to address the global injustices facing historically marginalised communities, and especially our young people. Their interests are being overlooked by those in power who won't live to bear the burden of a burning planet. As championed by Fridays for Future and Greta Thunberg, we need to change the voting age to 16 everywhere so young people can be empowered and have a voice in political decision making. That's also why we need citizens' assemblies to allow ordinary people, young and old, to decide the scale and pace of transition on the basis of independent scientific advice. So XR, I'm sure some of you are members of it or have taken part in its actions or have watched, um, I hope, with... Uh, uh, with some admiration, has been phenomenally successful in the short space of time in alerting people to the need for fundamental changes, like the ones I outlined above. Extinction Rebellion's artistic, festival-like actions have put the need for global system change on the political map at the very highest level. In the UK, where XR was founded and is strongest, the whole country is now engaged in deep conversations about the need for radical change. Political party leaders from all sides stood up to congratulate Extinction Rebellion for their disruptive yet peaceful actions that shut down large parts of central London for 10 days, during which nearly 1,130 activists were arrested, and many of whom are now um, facing um, uh, court proceedings, and uh, that's happening at the moment, I'll talk about that later. I coordinated Extinction Rebellion's political team meetings with the government and with the London Mayor, and so I'm especially pleased with the rapid political progress that was made. On the 1st of May 2019, the UK Parliament passed a non-legally binding motion uh, recognising the climate emergency. It then legislated a legally binding target of net zero by 2050, one of the first major industrialised countries to do so. This fast tracking would never have happened without XR working closely with the global strike movement that brought Greta Thunberg to the UK. This was key as she put pressure on all our political leaders. She met with them and basically said, go and meet the rebels. In 2019, Parliament, when it remits maybe in the autumn, uh, will have to, well, supposed to reconsider the emergency motion. This is important as we're like, likely, all of this is now, you know, I wrote it yesterday, um, is going to have to be revisited. <laughs> so we were supposed to have the party seasons, the party conference seasons, and uh, a huge amount of work was being done to ensure that every single political party was going to um, have a, a radical climate change programme. Uh, many of the campaigners, including parts of Extinction Rebellion, are pushing for some kind of Green New Deal, um, which is gaining traction in the US. Um, and with other movements, uh, for example, This Is Zero Hour and the Sunrise movements, which in the US have made... Uh, a lot of progress, again also by taking disruptive, peaceful actions. The Green New Deal seeks a social justice-based approach to rapid decarbonisation based on renewable energy, clean air and community resilience and the prioritisation of historically marginalised communities. Extinction Rebellion's UK's immediate political successes are underpinned by a change of national mood on the issue. After ignoring climate change for a long time, UK media are running climate stories every day in response to XR's telling the truth demands. Um, hundreds of councils, I think it's about 150, but the number keeps changing, have now passed climate emergency motions, and local extinction value groups are being formed every day, networking with other local activists, working on food, waste, health, air pollution and transport problems. They are designing actions that challenge the build-out of fossil fuel infrastructure, 
like the proposed new Heathrow runway, and unnecessary new roads, as well as tackling the marketing and advertising industry. Solidarity actions with the Amazonian people, for example, are planned for the coming week, raising awareness of many of our forest fires, including in other countries like Bolivia and Indonesia. Some workplaces, too, are radicalising in response to uh, the activism through decentralised processes where people can get together and create new sector-specific groups. For example, Extinction Rebellion educators or Extinction Rebellion doctors. Um, I think there's a proposal for Extinction Rebellion lawyers as well. I'm definitely not the only lawyer, as you know, the talk says, the Extinction Rebellion lawyer. There's lots of us. <laughs> Extinction Rebellion is targeting fashion because it's the second most uh, polluting industry in the world after fossil fuels and asking its members and you to boycott buying new clothes because frugal is the new fashion. Hundreds of famous musicians, prestigious arts and cultural organisations like Tate Modern have recognised they need to do something more. They have launched initiatives called Music Declares or Culture Declares, announcing their commitments to tackling the music and ecological emergency. More importantly, people are having conversations in their workplaces and playgrounds even about how to eat less meat, how to fly less and what it means <laughs> to live in a climate emergency. The public now regard climate action as urgent, above what they used to say were top priorities such as Brexit. That might slip again, but we'll come back to that. Certainly the apathy and despair that marked the climate movement before April has shifted. UK NGOs and campaigners are raising their game as a result of the courageousness of the actions by many of the activists who took part in April and subsequently. As coordinator of the political team until June, I have to say I feel exhilarated by these achievements. Um, we have in Extinction Rebellion three sort of big teams. The biggest teams are actions team and the movement team. Um, and we have a sort of, Extinction Rebellion has a sort of decentralised structure. Um, but I have to say that quite a lot of these positions of, um, as coordinators and um, uh, people who are in those teams are... Um, members of my generation, I'd say, you can guess how I'm later, <laughs> who recognise that the need for younger people in the movement is vital. That's why XR Youth has become part of the Anchor Circle, uh, alongside activist groups from the Global South who are supported by Extinction Rebellion's International Solidarity Network. I think the two biggest injustices in the world right now are how we treat nature and especially the indigenous communities and poor people who are often on the front line of ecological destruction and how we treat young people. In both cases, we're leaving an enormous, massive burden of irreversible changes, destabilisation, possible collapse of food and agriculture systems we are having to deal with, plus the mental anxiety and anguish and psychological burden that goes with having to fix uh, a, a broken system. Older people, I can count myself in that now because I'm 1964 actually, so just uh, 1965, just um, past the baby, baby boomers by a year. Older people have always tended to have a disproportionate share of economic and political power, but this has got worse with baby boomers being expected to live longer and not having their life chances devastated by the global financial crisis of 2008, which has disproportionately impacted millennials and Generation Z. Young people are aware of how the current system has effectively disenfranchised them. Their bullshit radars are fully operational and they know we have to change the system. Anyone born after 2013 is already likely to live uh, a lifetime beyond the current climate models, which is really scary because they're projecting out to 2100 in most cases. Their world map does not even look like the world of today. As a mother of four children, I worry about what the future holds for them. I think constantly about the legacy of my generation and how much hardship my children will face. This definitely makes the problem feel more pressing to me personally. My 11 year old went on many of the school strikes with his friend and watched me super glue myself to shell. Like all parents, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to keep my children safe and out of danger. And right now, that means rebelling against a way of life that is destroying their life chances and doing all I can to support global youth in their movement building.
Writing about law and advising is no longer enough. We need everyone to undertake peaceful mass civil disobedience to create enough political noise and generate the demand for a new political reality the whole world over. And if we, ca if we can't get there, if we work in silos, when we, when we can't get there, if we work in silos and factions, we need to unite and create a dynamic, which often is referred to as a movement of movements, and model the urgency and the unity we need right now. Greta Thunberg wisely said that when the rules are broken, you cannot rely on them and must change them. Many people are still trying to work within those rules, and I admire them. We need all hands on deck, be it lawyers working on the Paris Agreement negotiations, Pacific Island youths who are now demanding that the World uh, Court, the International Court of Justice, um, is write an opinion on the issue of climate damage, or plaintiffs bringing class actions by petitioning courts on the inaction and fraud being committed potentially by big oil companies like Exxon and Shell. But while all these are necessary, they may take a long time and produce only incremental changes. Some climate mitigation is already asking governments to do a little bit more what we call mitigation, reducing greenhouse gases. And that's a deliberate choice by those lawyers who have taken those cases forward for their clients or for the NGOs. But I think it's not asking for radical enough changes to business as usual. For example, they're really asking for reparations for loss and damage already running into billions the burden of which is increasingly being felt by the poor and by the vulnerable countries that I often work with, like the Marshall Islands. The movement of movements must put forward these more radical demands and empower youth and marginalised communities everywhere. I think we need to be bolder and to work faster than courts can act right now. And they will not deliver the fundamental transformational changes we need in the next few years unless and until they are accompanied by people also breaking the law as part of a mass movement movement of movements based on civil disobedience. It's critical, in my view, that some of those who disobey the law are lawyers. <laughs> lawyers are often rightly regarded as part of the establishment and the elites. But I believe lawyers also have a special role in mobilising mass movements. This is because their view of what our political system, uh, whether our political system is just or unjust, is based on solid expertise. They are adept at knowing how far and fast we can get changes within the established rules and that constitute the present legal and political order. They are also quite good at knowing when it becomes impossible to make those foundational rules work quickly. It's no coincidence that Gandhi and Nelson Mandela were lawyers who chose to use law breaking as a key tool in their successful resistance to end imperialism and apartheid. I'm willing to ask lawyers to speak some fundamental legal truths. To say that the present form of capitalism and the rules that accompany it cannot be fixed with a tweak to a law here and there, because it's the whole system of nature destruction based on overconsumption that generates wealth for a few, which is creating the planetary emergency. But nor am I contemplating or uh, asking for the abandonment of the entire international legal and national fabric. Legal wins like the 2015 Paris Agreement took a mammoth effort, lasting 10 years of negotiations, to get 200 countries to agree the very basic goal of planetary safety, which is a well below 2 degrees and 1.5 degree target, which was a sort of north star for the international community. And they've also agreed to ratchet up their national climate commitments every five years. Paris is full of flaws, it isn't as perfect, it's not perfect, it's um, considerably weaker than it we would have liked to, it to have been, but it does have significant real impacts on the real economy. That's why the climate deniers, the big oil companies, the Trump administration and allies like its allies like Saudi Arabia are trying now to undermine it because bolder commitments are required legally under the Paris Agreement in 2020, which is next year. Paris also contains legally significant provisions on providing finance and support for loss and damage being sustained by vulnerable countries facing climate de devastation. <coughs> My work with Frontline Small Islands has shown me that progress is possible and we cannot give up on them when they are asking us to fight for them in solidarity for their survival, which sadly may now include abandonment of certain islands that have been their homes for thousands of years. Survival is a powerful instinct and it's hard sometimes to keep going. 
That's one of the poets that, um, I like Yeats, says, there is a fine balance between hope and despair, and we must use our failures as stepping stones for successes. I've come to this insight after a prolonged period of despair myself, which paralysed me from the end of 2016 to late 2018 when I decided to join Exile. I was burnt out from the Paris negotiations and had not fully emotionally processed the untimely passing of my mother, my father and my brother in close succession. The crunch came for me in October 2018 when the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, released its special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees. Even though it was hopeful in some ways, it showed me we still had time to stop complete ecocide, it was also terrifying because it showed how little time we had to change things. I knew I had to do something quite different from my normal diplomacy and legal work that I had left behind. My disillusion at the diplomatic work had set in the previous year, where we had put so much effort into a process called Noir Dialogues, which took place under the UN Paris Agreement negotiations. These dialogues were intended to raise climate ambition, but it made me furious to see countries like uh, Norway, the UK and Germany, which often regard themselves as climate leaders, not doing enough to tackle their existing climate commitments. At the annual UN meeting on climate change in Bonn at the end of 2017, it became clear to me that polite diplomacy wasn't going to result in delinking the global economy, and we needed new political movements filled with outrage and new ideas to topple the toxic forms of nature-debasing capitalism. I thought these movement needed establishment people, like me, establishment friendly people, who could say something like, this old way of doing things isn't working, these rules are not adding up, we need to break them, and to be taken seriously. That's when I joined Extinction Rebellion. On reflection, I realised I had in fact been part of the old way of doing things since the very beginning of my own legal career. When I went to the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, very long time ago, fresh out of law school, I learned there was always a space for creative thinking in law and that wordsmiths can birth new norms and rules that limit polluters and protect natural resources. But when I think back to that time, I realise I didn't appreciate the scale of destruction unleashed by global capital on nature and frontline communities defending it, nor how quickly countries would export their dirtiest industries, us included here in the UK, to China, India and other developing countries who in turn adopted the same extractive mode of capitalism. Like much of the climate movement, I worried about how I would look saying something as radical as the system is broken. I chose to play within the rules. I focused, I think, too much on the inside political negotiations, drafting words that paved over the cracks and greenwashed uglier realities and not enough on the outside, movement building dynamics changing underlying political realities. We saw climate change as a technical, managerial problem and thought solutions based on scientific and economic expertise would be enacted by governments in the long-term interests of their citizens. But I think we didn't realise that we had left out or three critical elements from the equation. We'd left out how we mobilise on a mass basis, how we mobilise people, how we respect their human rights, and how we restore nature. In hindsight, I, un I understand that you can't do it all alone through elite advocacy based on reports from experts, particularly not on issues which require such fundamental and structural change as climate change does. Of course, there are people in social justice movements at the time talking about more radically uh, more radical system change solutions and rejecting all policy changes at the UN and climate negotiations as incremental and sellouts. I worried that they were making the perfect the enemy of the good. I believed incremental steps would indeed build confidence and provide an evidence base for more radical steps. Surely some agreed action was better than nothing at all. There is no point throwing a baby out with a bathwater, I told myself year after year. There was also a deeper reason for my attachment to the insider game. I so wanted to believe that our democracy, our governments elected on existing political processes, could provide transformational changes that were fair and pro-poor. I believed you, could ha you couldn't have system change without at least some basic agreed rules, institutions and processes that would make the process work. 
But now looking back, I see that our failure to build movements to challenge the corruption and power of incumbents of existing uh, economic ways of, uh, uh, of, of growth, our failure to centre our vision on human rights and nature drew energy away from the critical steps we needed to take. I regret that I didn't see those calling for system change as closer allies. Their points were totally valid and they were right to be sceptical of government negotiations going on that were resulting in, year in, year out, diminished chances of planetary safety. I think looking back at my career... Victorium, ...but we're going to try. Um, so we've got a good about half an hour. We've got May Pucky, who's going to help us. Um, so we've just got one mic, and I think the way we're going to do it is I'm going to hand the mic over to May, and we're going to collect about three questions at a time and then Pana will respond. Um, so it can be a question or it can be a thought or a comment. Um, so I'm going to pass it to May and then put your hand up the usual kind of way if you want to ask a question or, or say something. First of all, um, thank you, a very warm thank you to you, Farhana. Um, this actually isn't a question, it's a message, so it won't need a response. So please bear with me on this. Uh, my name is Linda, um, I'm here with Antonio, and we're from XR in Taunton in Somerset, but we'd like to share a brief message from XR in Slough, a group our son is active in. And he says, Dear Farhana, in your essay, um, th in This Is Not A Drill, you write, we need everyone to undertake mass civil disobedience to create a new political reality the whole world over. We can't get there if we work in silos and factions. We need a movement of movements to model the unity and urgency we need right now. Your words resonate deeply with us, Farhana. They help us to understand that unless we create a movement at home, which not only welcomes but actively supports the interests of the full diversity of our town across race, gender, class, sexuality and access lines, we will have failed. We are working hard to achieve this. As an act of solidarity, our art department would like to give you and members of this meeting tonight a t-shirt which was designed and hand screen printed in our art lab in Slough. Its slogan reads, a movement of movements. The t-shirts were sourced from charity shops on Slough High Street, and the prints have been specially heat cured to ensure they're washed safe, so you can wash them as you would any normal t-shirt. Um, you're welcome to collect a t-shirt from the front of the stage at the end of this meeting. Um, they're a free gift to our fellow West Country rebels. Wear them with pride. And we have one last thing to add. When sourcing the t-shirts, we ended up with the majority of women's garments, um, rather than men's. Men, please don't be too disappointed, they are probably about five for men. We took this as a sign that you will understand as well as we did, that the rebellion always has and always will be woman-led. <laughs> side in law is um, how encouraging it is to you as a lawyer and, and how, how much it's advancing and how much it's mm -hmm. going to help us. Um, I understand there's a lot we can do from the bottom up but I'm also, I need some yeah, hope from the top down that Echoside is on a good path to making a difference. <coughs> a, a controversial question. Um, so when you talk about Extinction Rebellion to communities that are not part of the community of Extinction Rebellion, um, some of the responses they will say is that it's very much of a middle class um, 
community in order to rebel and get on the streets. You have to be in a certain position um, and in order to be, um, to be able to go through the legal system, um, you have to have a sense of kind of privilege. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on that. I think that involves three questions. <laughs> So shall I, shall I respond? Well, first of all, a huge thank you to Exile Taunton and Exile Slough for the t-shirts and the, these gifts. And I think one of the remarkable things is actually the gifting of time and talent and the turning away from the com consumer kind of economy and the traditional ways in which, you know, some of the NGOs have bought into that and you have to buy the, the t-shirt or you have to buy the badge or buy the cuddly toy and, you know, I think Extinction Mill has really struck a chord with the DIY approach that actually making stuff yourself, cre being creative, is hugely liberating and empowering. And I find that really, really charming that you've designed and taken words um, and created something also that would have been going to waste. So, yeah, I, I'm really touched by that. So, thank you. Thank you so much. So, the ecocide question. Yeah, I think ecocide. Um, has come to a great deal of prominence and actually Extinction Rebellion has helped highlight the work that was being done by Polly uh, Higgins, uh, who you know, really saw a big gap that we did not criminalise. We didn't use criminal law, one of the most powerful branches of law that we have, um, to, to tackle this planetary scale emergency and that you know, these smaller... Uh, uh, degradations of nature and ecosystems have now added up to that point where we're actually literally decimating huge ecosystems like the entire coral reefs of the world, you know, literally. And we'll, we'll die, most of them, above 1.5 and they're immensely damaged already. And obviously the people who are still dependent on nature, who live in nature, who have a close affinity and their culture is respectful and is nature, are also suffering from uh, diminished ways in which they practice nature and their relationship um, uh, with their ecosystems is hugely significant in a way that I think we struggle to understand. So the people of the Amazon, obviously you're <coughs> seeing that very much now, is, you know, it's not, it's not just a place, it's not just timber, it's actually their home and it's their spiritual and cultural uh, uh, um, uh, homeland. Um, the, the, the specifics, I get a little bit legal about it, so I think the concept of ecocide was very important and I really want to support all that is being done. I think the specific legal sort of strategy of going to the International Criminal Court and making ecocide um, uh, a, a, an international crime by amending the statute of that set up the ICC, I think that itself is not... Um, you know, it's a huge, uh, t time consuming and quite risky venture. Let me just say that. That's how my view of it as a legal strategy. I feel it's like going back, you know, as someone who's negotiated these international norms and rules and agreements, that could almost be a lifetime's work. That's not to say it will necessarily be. So the concept of genocide and crimes against humanity emerged very, very rapidly after World War II ended in order to prosecute the existing Nazi high command. So there was a, almost a, a sudden creation of new legal rules that were created in order to punish a crime that up, up until that time hadn't been named. So there are very fast and rapid ways of developing laws. But I think actually, in my view, there's huge um, numbers of um, jurisdictions that already recognise and punish Ecocide, so using some of those legal tools would be really helpful, but also recognising, I think, and trying to use different legal um, avenues is good, which is why I mentioned the Pacific Island students who have been campaigning in the last few months to take um, climate, to take, get the International Court of Justice to issue an advisory opinion. So, in fact, an advisory opinion may be perhaps a, one of the stepping stones, it may fail to establish a crime of ecocide, but it may be one of those failures, the stepping stones that we talked about on our way to getting there. But I, I hope that um, you know, a lot more progress can be made. And that's where I think the inside-outside game is really important. I, mean, I don't mean that's game, but you know, the, the dynamic of some lawyers who are working in the system and pushing it to its very maximum and others who are outside calling 
um, calling out the eco side and showing that actually the legal systems are inadequate. I don't know if that answers your question a bit. So um, on the on the issue of different communities and the issue of class, I think look much of the environment movement, the climate movement, is middle class in the in the in the developed world. That's you know in the Western world, in the UK, the USA, by and large. Um, in terms of the existing memberships of NGOs and, uh, you know, you have to have a certain amount of income and a certain amount of time to, you know, set up your direct debit and all the rest of it. So, but that's not the case in many developing countries and it's not the case with the newer movements that are arising up because they are seeing uh, pollution and destruction through what I emphasise as a social justice lens. So, seeing the fact that, you know, toxic air um, is is a problem which actually disproportionately affects poorer communities and if you fix toxic air actually you also reduce greenhouse gas emissions enormously so I live in London and you know boroughs like Tower Hamlets, boroughs like Newham are the most polluted boroughs. If you look in, in those boroughs as to where the most polluted streets are, so in the same, they're the same streets that are the the lowest income streets and they're the streets where often the poorest level of housing and the most social housing is concentrated. So tackling environmental degradation, tackling social justice is, I feel, very, very um, connected and it's been in fact really frustrating that people haven't understood that uh, connection and have seen climate change as some kind of elite issue, which it isn't, I think, at all. And I think, you know, finding out um, the enormous um, consequences for food security, for, um, you know, basic life conditions. So, L Yemen, for example, Syria, these are areas there where there is now war and conflict uh, between people, which is directly based on a diminished, uh, a diminished environment based on the, essentially, uh, less and less rain falling. So yeah, these massive consequences affect everyone, not just middle class people. I have to say, you know, that I'm a trustee of three different charities, so uh, in the end, we have to use our privilege. If you're privileged, and many of you are because you're here in the evening, not balancing three jobs or looking after kids or doing something else, you've got the time and the privilege of of your own decisions to take action, then let's let's use that privilege. Let's call on more people. And I think that's why in the number of people who've been arrested, for example, for the Rebellion, you know, there's a lot of older people actually, a lot of young people. There's a lot of older people who have decided, you know, I am not um, uh, I haven't got a big mortgage left anymore. I've got no families that are depending on me. I can afford to get arrested in terms of giving up my time and my liberty. So I feel like in some ways maybe we should turn around the, the question of privilege and use our privilege. And that's why I talked a little bit about my, my you know, I have a privileged position as a lawyer. I'm educated, I'm eloquent, people are interested in my story. So there's a lot of interest, you know, who is this lawyer who's breaking the law? In my story is a, someone who got arrested versus maybe someone else who got arrested because of that voice and that place that I have. So I feel Extinction Rebellion, you know, needs to do a lot more to really engage with those issues of social justice, to engage with those who've been already, um, frankly, screwed by the system once, uh, twice, many times. You know, when I was acting for the Marshall Islands, one of the first things the president said to me is, you know, we were talking about climate change being really devastating, and she said, you know, Fahana, our country has, um, you know, suffered the most serious nuclear testing of all of the countries in the Pacific. We've got entire islands that have been um, contaminated and where people, in some cases, were forced to live and weren't allowed to be evacuated. Um, so they're nations of survivors as well, and we have to remember that, you know, um, they're fighting for um, tackling a system which has time and time again, you know, uh, resulted in, in the destruction of their homelands and so that's another reason for, I think, privileging and prioritising their, their voices. That's what I try and do and I hope Extinction Rebellion does that as well as other, other movements.
That's a bit of an answer, so. Don't have a very good answer other than feeling the rising level of anxiety um, in our nation's children and globally, actually. Um, and I think one of the ways in which we can test whether a system is broken or not is simply ask if our future generations really believe in it. And I think that's why so many youth are out striking, because they have already experienced the depth to which the system is broken and they don't understand or accept how it's going to be fixed other than through action. So I feel like in many ways you're ahead of the curve um, in channeling also some of that anxiety into action. Um, and I, I think that one of the most important successes for Extinction Rebellion is actually the convergence and actually the way in which the global strike movement evolved you know, from October sort of onwards, actually, you know, um, Greta launched it in August, but it really only took off sort of from October, November onwards, the same time as Extinction Rebellion was taking off. The same time, by the way, that Sunrise and Zero Hour were taking off in the in the US. So I think there's tremendous potential for um, leadership from ordinary um, um, pupils from ordinary children. My 11 year old is very eloquent, far more eloquent than me on, on the TV actually when he was interviewed. Um, so I, I think we can't, I think, say we've got easy solutions either, um, but I think getting young people involved and asking them to imagine the world and use their creativity, their lack of cynicism, their hope. Um, in ways to hold politicians to account and demand that you all have the vote at the age of 16, basically, will really change things. I really hope that um, that that's a, um, you know you guys can hold on and not not get more and more anxious. Although I realise you know it's it's hard not to watch the news and be terrified, um, but there are amazing things going on. And Greta's arrived in the, in, in New York, and that's an amazing. You know, act of courageousness in itself. Like, would you put yourself in a two-week boat of that size across the Atlantic? I don't think so. Um, not that brave. Um, so, I think the other question was about about the October Rebellion, and especially now. So, um, back in April, uh, sorry, in March, which was before the April Rebellion, there was a lot of discussion because you remember the deadline for Brexit was originally the thirty-first of March and what would be happening in that April period. So in the end, it was postponed. But we had a lot of discussions internally amongst the strategy group, particularly the political group, about the, the risks of whether there would be essentially a, other movements taking advantage and rising up at that time. Um, and I think now, given what's happened, the likelihood of that is, is far bigger. So all I can say is actually that this discussion is starting to take place, there's a strategy process going on, I'm not involved in it this, this time, but I worry far, far more about this period. Obviously it is a no Brexit scenario as well, it's not even a, a scenario and we won't have Parliament given at this rate um, to go on. So I, I feel like actually we're in a, a much more dangerous period, literally a much more dangerous period, and I personally think that we we already seeing, um, yeah, it's essentially very akin to fascism, you know, taking over. Um, that's what it looks like. I don't know what other, what people think it looks like. I think this is kind of what it looks like. Um, and diminishing more and more. I do worry a lot more also because I mean I, I'm a lawyer so I used to get paid to worry about things that other people think you know that's one of the things that you do is you just look at all the risks that there are but I think it's also very different a rebellion taking place now which shuts down some parts of central London or you know specific sites given what the police have said and given where the complexion of this government frankly is and what the you know this is we now have a Prime Minister who ordered the water cannons. Do you remember that? <laughs> so, uh, I do worry about what what that might happen, but at the same time, you know, um, I think there's tremendous wisdom in the hive mind, and that people can and should vote with their feet and vote also for safer ways of 
upholding democracy, um, which is, I feel, a fundamental reason why I joined Extinction Rebellion, is actually the, um, the third demand about citizens' assemblies is essentially reinventing democracy you know, and, and supplementing and uh, taking that further. So I feel like we should all be out on the streets in some way um, supporting that. And I think it would be, in my personal view, as I said, this will get decided at other times, this is now the moment for us to stand and build that movement of movements. You know, if we allow this ridiculous process to go on and pretend that a vote, you know, in 2016, which we know was influenced by um, shady money and oligarchs and algorithms, um, you know, what are, we, what are we saying about democratic processes? So I personally feel like, yeah, my energy right now will be to support those dynamics. Um, I haven't quite decided what I'll do in October myself, we're still seeing that. And then in terms of the, um, how do we appeal to, to, the, to the right, um, again, by, by saying that this is an issue that affects everyone, of whether you're your left wing or right wing, those categories don't really make much sense. I did a little quick analysis, um, which was mentioned in the Gove meeting, if you watched it. You know, the for the last 50 years, we've had roughly 30 years of Tory-led governments, or Tory governments, and in this country, 20 years of, of Labour. And both of them have destroyed the environment. Both of them have, you know, shared a paradigm of <coughs> GDP, nature extractive growth. Um, so I think all, every, all, everyone needs to find solutions. The only comfort I have is in the UK. It's very, the UK is quite special, you know, because it has a cross party support for radical climate action. We sort of forget that because we want to go even faster and even quicker. But I think, you know, we had the Climate Change Act in 2008, which was actually set up. Um, and created by NGOs, Friends of the Earth, and many other movements, who then got the Tories to propose it, um, and then Labour and Blair took it over. So actually there's possibilities for consensus and for unity and for long-term national thinking as well. Um, so I feel I can't give up completely. And the best hope I have is that we need to ask really searching questions of of the Tories right now, like what is their version of the Green New Deal? How do they think, you know, other than cancelling specific, like Heathrow or cancelling, you know, some specific projects, what do they think will get us to those radical reductions? What will really renew, you know, um, this country's very ancient housing stock, you know, the sort of 30 million buildings that most of them are 100 years old that need, you know, radical energy efficiency improvements. So, I think there's always a possibility of creating that, but I have to say I do have a lot of misgivings about this particular government at this point in time. It's got climate deniers, and, um, you know, people who are fundamentally anti-democratic and who are favouring a deal with the US. So, um, yeah, tough times ahead. Thank you. I'm afraid it's come we're past seven o'clock, and this is.
happy and making more planets. I think most people agree with that. So, but, so, but actually shows. saying it, maybe finding different vocabulary is fine, but I think saying actually the whole system, which is predicated on pushing you to buy, consume, and see yourself as unable to you know, stop that first kind of behavior. Because in the end, the companies then say, oh, we're just supplying the people. People have got to want less. They do. Yeah. But but maybe that's what the, the, the message has to be. You've got to want less because because we are living in a capitalist system. If you want it, you're going to get it. So if we wanted less, then they would stop. You know, people would, the companies would produce less. Less. I don't. See, I don't think that's the case because they are. They've got to switch to. You know, they can switch to producing stuff on a circular economy and taking up. There are many, many incentives that we could create and do away with. So, so I do think that it's not it's this form of capitalism which says never ending growth, such as resources, don't worry about the pollution, we'll take care of it later, or some future technology will take care of it. Yeah. I do, I do realise I sound like a socialist worker. <laughs> That's right. It's just that, that, is, that that's the thing. I think, because, but I think that's the thing that, that, that stops the, the bankers. The, but they, we've got to be more radical and challenge the bankers. I yeah. feel like that's actually why we're here in 2008. And I did mention it in this speech. You know, not a single person was convicted of trashing the yeah. world, no. <laughs> trashing this generation's future. I'm, yeah, shocking. It's shocking. Yeah. So the degree of legal impunity and who gets us yeah. is comfortable, literally, is the massive injustice. And that's, that injustice is being just reproduced. And we've, yeah. we've normalised it. Apples for the normalised My concern, I, I agree with everything you said, but my concern is, you know, for instance, MI5 on Radio 4 a, a few weeks ago saying that Extinction Rebellion is potentially a threat to our establishment, uh, society. So they would say that. I, I know, they would. And, 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 they, and, they, and rightfully, you know, there are a lot of vested interests who are scared. Yeah. And they should be scared, yeah. because what they're doing is wrong. And I agree with you, we need to change how we value nature. We need to change the whole consumerist society we live in. But I, I, I'm concerned that if we go up against all these vested interests at the same time, you know, we're going to delay action. And, and delay is is right now too scary. We have to. The system is broken, in my opinion. The system is broken. It just is. I just believe it. Totally. It's not getting us anywhere. In all my life, I've never seen the political system working properly. I'm 47. Yeah. So I just think it's done. And, and for, for this to be happening to the world, it is broken. So. Anyway. Yeah, this is a bit tangential. But um, the other day I read a book about, basically it was about nature and spirituality and the ways in which all nature is interlinked and the universe is interlinked. And if you believe in it, there's a creative God that kind of oversees it. How do you, how do you think that religious and spiritual movements engage with not just climate change, but environmental change in general. Because sometimes in America, in the past, you would hear people with religious rights saying that climate change is real and so on. How can religion and spirituality be a change, a force of good? Well, I mean, I, I personally think that like the Pope issued an encyclical, like two years, or well, last year, the year before actually, which was enormously important um, and basically recognised that, you know, it's a, it's a legal, it's a, it's a spiritual obligation, it's a Christian obligation to protect nature. That was really important actually, and that all the right people did, all the right people did, especially in the US, and basically said, so I think for some people, you know, accepting that the nature it just defies their view that we've interfered with creation yeah. on that scale. They simply can't accept it for doing that. But I think most of the most, most, some some of the really radical rebels have come from the 
but they don't see the vision of how we can yeah. change things. They feel disempowered and the it's like, how are we going to make this happen? And, you know, the, the, the call for a system change may resonate with people. Yes, we need to, you know, how does that look like? What does it mean? So I think we need a roadmap. We need to be clearer about how we can get there without it being a revolution that people find scary. That's why I did, look, so, I did put a whole two paragraphs right up front saying, actually, sometimes all you need to do is stop doing the bad stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. you make space. Yeah, yeah. Here are the yeah. bad things that are going on that we continually yeah, actually yeah. give large lots of money for in this case. Yeah. And new acts and stuff. They're quite, they're quite big picture. Like, yeah. in the end, you know, the National Health Service was invented. There was legislation. Yeah. You can envisage. You don't have to vision the whole society. You can start, right. you know, by rewilding, by, yes, you know, stop subsidising yeah. the bad stuff. That's a big yeah. enough thing. That's actually yeah. what we have to do. That's the yeah. I'm not. I think more. It's all right. No, I was just thinking about Heathrow Airport actually, yeah, exactly. not do, not, not expanding that, that. Yeah. and Bristol yeah. Airport and the yeah. others. Yeah. The major expansion of all the local airports, you know, city airports, local. Mm. Airports. I think what's alarming for a lot of people. I mean, yeah. a lot of people work in jobs that depend on a consumer society. You know, you mentioned the past fashion. So if everyone ideally stopped buying all this fast fashion, all these shops are at Extra High Street, and thousands of people will be thrown out of work. As you were saying, we need a roadmap, we, 
where I, I, I can't see the vision for how we want to re-employ people, offer them a way to make a living. If, for example, everybody starts buying the fast fashion, I think that's where the climate extinct, uh, extinction rebellion movement. Okay. Makes the messengers, aren't they? They're just, they're just passing the message on to the body. We're not saying what the answers are. We're just passing the message and trying to get people to realise. Somebody has yourself, you know, sort of green new deal. Green new deal is something that's rebellion. brilliant that we need to really be driving in this country, and that creates jobs. You know, that, that can a lot of people want that as well. Yeah. It's happening. I mean, there's a definite shift. It's just, you know, we need policies and, and, and specific, you know, um, interventions that are incremental and, and uh, fast. Yeah, very fast. Very fast. But I, I'm optimistic. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, it is. And, um, you know, oh, sorry, I didn't realize you were waiting. I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah. Well, that. Um, first of all, you inspired me to do it. Um, yeah. 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 I saw, I did that, but then I, got, I went home again on the, on the Monday. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and I saw it going off. To be honest, yeah. very yeah. easy. Yeah. They can't see it. I've got to go and 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 i have 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 got to go
I don't know who your lawyers are, but there's three or four law firms yeah, who are advising. Bindman's and... Bindman's is mine, you know, Hodgson's Allen's, there's a couple of others, depending on the coffee If you have local solicitors, no. No, because I haven't even been charged. No, I haven't. They're probably a bit frightened of, of you so because you're a lawyer. Do you know what? Okay, okay. Well, you're nice. I think they don't know what to do with me because also my action, initially they arrested me for being yeah, yeah, damage and it's yeah, really difficult to show being damage and super gluing yourself to a, in effect, a lot of people. There is no real damage. <laughs> and the last thing they want to do is be like, you know, like I am sort of well known and, and make a movie and that's why I did it, like, you know, that, that case. And I wanted to join the other people's case. Yeah. which is happening this week so that's also why I'm personally waiting and seeing what happens to them so the other the people who did the you know sat on the DLR. The, not the DLR, the DLR Cathy, you know, they're, they're definitely... Yeah, they got off the case. No, 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 they, they were challenged. Oh, no, it's the... Um, yeah, maybe no, no, the, yeah, the, the, the people who did the, you know, the, the balcony kind of thing over the Shell building, mm -hmm. sat there for three days, yeah. and then the, the women who broke the actual glass doors, their cases this week, uh, got some of their cases this week, <laughs> this, this uh, next week, so so we'll see what they say, but originally I wanted to be charged with them because I personally do not want it to be, you know, you'll be, you'll be police informants by the <laughs> So yeah, I wanted to be charged. And I'm I part of the Heathrow pause actually, yeah, so, so you're, you're okay. I'm going to get arrested, I, I think, for that. Court. I didn't want to go to a magistrate no. for the Crown no. Court. You have a jury trial and you get all of the... You like to get off, you'll, you'll get off but you also have a bigger profile yeah. case yeah. and you can make the conscientious protector arguments, which you can't get away from the magistrate. There's no different process that whole Yeah, no, exactly. We've noticed that those people that are pleading guilty are getting in the papers, and yeah. the people that are pleading not guilty are getting in the stories. So that's another thing to consider as well. But yeah, they, they do have a, you know, legal teams that are considering all the pros and cons. And it would be nice if they would... Yeah, everyone has to make a decision, like, yeah. you've got family, you've got kids, you may want to be re-offended, you may want to be re-offended, or you may decide, like, that's it, I didn't mind it. Um, you know, talking about it, thinking, what, what am I going to do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and is it better not to go to court and then go up to the team, not guilty? Go to court yeah. to do it and then back in the yeah. and then I can do something yeah. and go to the same crowd. That's my turn, I'm not saying that. I'm going to bang on the head, apparently. Why are you saying go? And to, to, you know, to do something which is, you know, and then to be honest, PR wise. You know, I did learn that. Yeah. I did have my family yeah. team, and yeah. my journalist friend, like this yeah. story. Yeah. So it's all. I love you, London. <laughs> 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 you're asking me about that. My husband also was like, "This one is lovely." Steve yeah. is so proud. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. I was the same. The story, the story was actually, and I have told it at the festival that originally I wanted to throw a pot of black paint, which is from Farrow Ball, the nice posh colour like this, at the building. Yeah, yeah. And then as I was leaving the house, as I was going before him, he said, what's that black stuff coming out of your bag? Oh, no. And I said, what's that stuff? And then I opened it, the entire thing had exploded inside my bag. It's like, oh, you open Stick with Dulux next yeah, time. Yeah, stick with Dulux and stuff. You know, no, no, because I'd opened the tip, so I had to ditch that flower. Right. And then just got the food in there. Can I just say, the emotional show when you read the pitch, <laughs> <laughs> it really resonated with my wife, my wife and I, we'd be so emotional just a day, just like every day, <laughs> you know, it's so difficult, the whole thing, we've got a seven and ten, uh, nine year old daughters, and they're just full of happiness, constantly, yeah. just watching them, yeah, I know, I know, I don't know, but I just, I feel like also, for me, that's a new thing, speaking more emotionally, actually I find it really difficult, yeah, I, it's much easier for me to give a lecture, yeah. I lecture all the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, in university, but, I mean, that's it's that's much that's more difficult than telling my story and how I feel, yeah. and what my Kids. motivations were, and looking back on my career, then, you know, and that's why I kind of decided, okay, I'm going to stick it to the text instead of trying to tell it, well, maybe I'll... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you know, that's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the people in the text are. Because we have to be emotional. Yeah, I mean, Gail, Gail Bradford is so emotional all the time. And, and many of them are. And I think that's, it's a human thing. That we can, you know, we can all relate to it. And it's so difficult. Thank you. Thank you for, you know, your work. Whatever you decide.
right. That's what good at saying. Whatever you feel is the right thing. You know, that bridge is going to go down in history. I feel like it was so beautiful. And the courage of those people on that day, like when I got arrested in the morning, I was up there and Kathy, the DLR lady, she was playing the gong. And it was this most fantastic noise and drama and watching. 